Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But uh, hey, listen, we, we, we've been on this series called At the Table, and, uh, and there's no greater invitation than the invitation that God has given us and those that have got to know him personally and intimately. Um, one of the things that we do at Elevate Church is that we're always casting our nets out. We're always connecting with people because we want them to experience and encounter the same God that, that we experience, that same love, that same transformation, that same change. Um, and that's always our ultimate goal. And what's interesting is, as, as we we're preparing for this message, I invited some people, some amazing people here from our, our church that uh, each one of them are very, very uh, unique and, and, and special in how they uh, connect with people and, and how they reach people. And each one has a, a, an amazing story you're going to love. But before we get to them, I was doing a research just to kind of get an idea of what people do when it comes to search on Google. And Google said this. Uh, Google in 2013 said the word church was typed in the search box 16 billion times one week before Easter. Now listen, <laughs> that was in 2013. We're in 2019. So for us that think people don't want to go to church is a big fat lie. People are searching for a place where they can come and encounter Almighty God. And we have the greatest opportunity in the next week to connect with people that you work with, to connect with people in our community, to connect with people in our, in our, in our family life. There's so many opportunities for us to connect with people every single week, and we can't miss it. Do you realize that, that Easter is probably the most attended service in the entire year, more than Christmas. And so there is no excuse for why we can't bring people to the table. And once again, if you've been here for a few weeks, you'll realize what we've been talking about. If you're not, go to live stream, watch the services. And hopefully we've been challenging you to, to really step up your spiritual walk as well. Because we talked about the, the three chairs, chair one, chair two, chair three. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but Easter is something huge for the believer, hopefully. Hopefully it's big for you. Because we're thinking, we're, listen, I've studied every religion. And I did on purpose because I used to be an atheist. So I studied every religion. And uh, what's interesting, as I looked at every single religion, I noticed that there was a common theme in people that believe in other religions. And that theme was this, is that their God is dead and Jesus is the only one that was resurrected. Like the only one. Study all of them. He's the only one that was resurrected. Every other God is a dead God. And so when we talk about having this passion for Christ, man, we should realize that we have the most alive God that people can literally experience through your life, through my life, every single day. And it doesn't just have to be on Easter Sunday, huh? But Easter is, is, uh, is the perfect opportunity. So I love the fact that, that God set us up for success and, uh, and gave us a Savior uh, who was resurrected and who's not a dead guy, but a living God. Now, I want to show you a quick video because I, I think so many of us can get so cold without even knowing. It's not that you're trying to be intentional to be a cold person and, and really stop thinking about people's eternity. But this video I'm about to show you, it's not meant for anyone to laugh, so please don't laugh. Uh, uh, it's not a joke. It's the reality of the world that we live in. This video is very, it's very heartbreaking. It's very disturbing. Um, but... When you see this video, before you're so quick to judge, I want you just to be reminded where you came from. Remember when you were lost? And we're so quick to judge people sometimes. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying Christ, the Christian world. Uh, because we forget about what we were saved from. And what we do is we learn to give the edited version of our salvation instead of the real story. And so I want to show you someone uh, who literally went viral, man. This thing went viral. And she did this on her own. She did this, and she wanted the world to know how messed up she is. I want you to watch this and pay attention and listen to the content. It'll just rock your world. Watch this. Hey, guys. So, like, I'm in the middle of editing, and my Instagram account got deleted. And 
I'm trying to get it back. I'm calling everybody I can. And I don't know why it's not working out for me. I'm in LA because of this. I'm in LA because I want to be on Instagram. And I'm randomly just recording this to put this in the video. I, I am nothing without my following. I am nothing without my following. And when people try to hate on me and report me, I'm literally trying to be a better person. I want to say to everybody that's been reporting me, think twice because you're ruining my life. Because I make all of my money online. All of it. And I don't want to lose that. And I know people like to see me be down and be like them and be like the 90 percenters, the people that work 9 to 5. That is not me. I am in LA to not be like that. I work so hard to get to where I'm at. And for that to get taken from me is the worst feeling in the world. It literally sucks having people want to come after you for no reason. It hurts. And I don't think people understand that, like, this is my life. I am nothing. I was a prostitute, for God's sakes. I was a prostitute. I stripped every single day. I don't even do that anymore because I make all of my money online. I don't want to go back to that life. From the bottom of my heart, it sucks. And the people that are laughing at this, <laughs> wanting me to get my account deleted, imagine if you were in my shoes. I was abandoned from my family. I've been backstabbed from everybody I know. <laughs> Except for maybe two people. Three people in my life. Three people in my life has not backstabbed me yet. <laughs> okay? Like... Try to be in my shoes for once because I guarantee you none of you would be lost in my shoes. That's the world we live in. That video was just two days ago. That's the reality. Now, you may be sitting here, and I know we've had all kinds of people here all day, and you may not be going viral, but you know that there are people even in the church that have this mindset that their whole worth is on social media, their whole value. Do you hear what she said? She's like, I'm nothing without this. Nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. That's the short version of the video. It's a longer video, but I just gave you guys an edited version. And I think that we fail to forget that there are people out there that need to meet Jesus, and the only way they're going to connect with Jesus is through followers like you and me. That's the only way they're going to know him. It's the only way they're going to know their love. That's the only way they're going to know their worth is through Jesus, and it's such a broken society, and it breaks my heart, and as I was, I've watched this video probably like 10 times already, but you know what I was thinking? I'm thinking, could you imagine if this girl has the audacity to go viral and, and put herself out there like that, which obviously didn't help her. It just made it worse, you know, and we pray for her salvation. You know, we pray that she never thinks of it. On, on the longer verse, she talked about even committing suicide. You know, I mean, like, wow, has it gone that bad? And the truth is, yes, it has. But I want you to picture this, and this is what I pictured. I told myself, I'm like, could you imagine if she, if she came to Christ? Can you imagine what kind, of, what kind of follower of Jesus she would be? Man, she wouldn't give a rip what people think. She would preach the gospel and wouldn't give a rip what people thought. We need to believe, God, that people like that would come to Jesus, right? That they would go from Saul's to Paul's and literally be a voice in this generation. And um, I was um, watching this, this interview between these two pastors and Billy Graham. And how many know that Billy Graham was, he was known in America as the pastor of America. Billy Graham was someone that was big on evangelism, not just in the United States. We're talking globally this man has probably led millions and millions and millions of people to christ jesus through a very simple message of god loves you simple message and we know that he was consistent throughout his walk with christ jesus and it's so rare in today's society to find serious legit christians in this society it really is it's it's so hard to find faithfulness in, in the world we live in today. But these two pastors were asking Billy Graham a question. This was right before he passed. They said to him, uh, Mr. Graham, how is it that throughout your lifetime, 
you had the ability to um, have influence and integrity. And they said this, they asked this question because they're, 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 the pastor was saying, um, in our culture today, you either have influence or integrity, but rarely do you have both. People either have a lot of influence, no integrity, or a lot of inf or a lot of integrity and no influence whatsoever. And so they asked him, so how did you have both? How did you do it? And Billy Graham responded with this in the interview. He said, I live with the end in mind because I know my end is coming. And he lived his life, his entire ministry life. He lived with an, the end in mind. He lived with eternity on his mind. And of course, after this interview, he died three days later. And it's interesting how when you look at society, when you look at, at Christians, um, we live like we're going to live forever. We act like we're going to live forever. So when you think and when you live and when you do like you're going to live forever, like no one's thinking about the end in mind. No one woke up this morning thinking about, hey, maybe I might die today. Right? I don't think anyone woke up that way. And so what happens is we become so self-absorbed with our own issues. We become so self-absorbed with our own drama, our trauma, and all those things. And listen, uh, God cares about all those things. But I think sometimes we just become so consumed with ourselves. No wonder we're so blinded by people like the girl that we saw on the screens. We can't even see broke if it was in front of us. And so here you have uh, uh, a man by the name of Billy Graham who, who is saying, live with the end in mind because your end is coming. Look at your neighbor and say, your end is coming. And Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 16, guys. And, uh, and, and he gives a, a great illustration about living with the end in mind. And I want you to listen because if you don't listen to this verse, you'll kind of just, you'll check out, you'll miss out what you're going to get today. But look what Jesus says. He's talking to his disciples and he says, once there was a rich man. So he gives this story. I love Jesus, always painting a picture. He said he was dressed in purple cloth and fine linen. And he lived an easy life every day. A man named Lazarus was placed at his gate. Lazarus was a beggar. His body was covered with sores. Even dogs came and licked his sores. All he wanted was to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Now, let me tell you something. There's, there's, there's tangible rich, riches, and then there's, um, there's spiritual riches. There's tangible poverty, and then there's spiritual poverty. And I know that many of us, we are rich in our salvation but sometimes we can be like the rich man at the table where we're just letting our crumbs fall off the ground and hoping someone gets a bite and so you can be so full of salvation so rich with words so rich and we live in a world and a society where you know what we have enough gospel in this world to to come to christ right but look at this it says even even the dogs came and licked his sores and he and all he wanted was was to eat what fell from the rich man's table. So we've been talking about that. The table is the place of food. Verse 22, uh, the time came when the beggar died. The angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In the place of the dead, the rich man was suffering terribly. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away. Lazarus was by his side. So the rich man called out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water. Then he can cool my tongue with it i am in terrible pain in this fire so we're talking about heaven and hell but abraham replied son remember what happened in your lifetime everybody say lifetime come on you got to live with the end in mind so many of us don't live with the end in mind you live like you're going to live forever but you're not you received your good things you received your houses your cars come on you got your careers nothing wrong with all that stuff that's awesome but what good does it do you to gain the whole world and lose your own soul like what is it with that you know, I say gain everything, get all that you want, right? Get the car, get the toys, get the boat, get the career, get the whatever, man. Get your easies. I don't care what you get. But not at the expense of ending this life and you lost your soul. Not at that expense. It's not worth it. But Abraham replied, son, remember when you were living it up? Remember when you thought you were all that in a bag of tortillas? Remember when you were all that? 
You received your good things. Lazarus received bad things. Now he is comforted here and you are in terrible pain. Besides, a white space has been placed between us and you. In other words, there is a gap between heaven and earth and hell. So those who want to be, uh, I'm sorry, so those who want to go from here to you can't go and no one can cross over from there to us. And the rich man answered, look at this. Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. Everybody say, say send. He's like, go. He's saying, send Lazarus for me then, please. To my family, I have five brothers. Come on, God, please send to reach my spouse. Send to reach my kids. Send to reach my, my nieces, my nephews, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins, my whatever. And let Lazarus warn them. Then they will not come to this place of terrible suffering. And Abraham replied, they have the teachings of Moses and prophets. Let your brothers listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will turn away from their sins. And Abraham said, listen, man, let's just get it real. They do not listen to Moses and they don't listen to the prophets. So they will not be convinced even if someone was to be raised from the dead. Wow. I think we're already living in that generation where you have people that, whose hearts are so hard that it don't matter what miracles in their face, they just ain't going to believe. But let me tell you something. You don't want to come to the place where either you or you know someone who is so far off and then regrets the reality and the truth that they had an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so I started talking with this amazing group yesterday, and, uh, and we were just talking about this, this at-the-table topic. And, you know, Chanel's awesome. Chanel has been here for one year. You actually gave your life to Christ here at, at Elevate Church a year ago. And before she gave her life to Christ, let me tell you something. This girl was a believer of all things. She was like new age and just everything mixed in there. But then she came here. And in one year, we talked about the chair, right? Chair one, chair two, chair three. This girl has already gone one, two, three in, in like a year. And her, her spiritual growth has been amazing in one year. But, but one thing we talked about uh, you yesterday was we talked about how you work in your field, your profession is medicine. And so you've worked heavily in the ER. And let me tell you, this woman has so much influence, like, it's ridiculous. We, we needed a favor from her recently, and uh, we just made one phone call to her, and she showed up at the hospital and just moved and shaked everybody around, like literally. Like anything and everything we needed was right there, which she's amazing. But she has not only worked in the ER, but she also has worked in the hospice. So, you know, Chanel is in these, these environments where people are at literally in their transition from life to death. You know what I'm saying? They're like literally, whether it's hours, day, I mean, what, 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 t- talk to me a little bit about that because yesterday when we talked, and I love this, and I did, I, you left me like, I was like, what? What does that mean? She said, nobody survives life. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm like come again? Like, what does that mean? And, and when she explained, I'm like, oh my God, you're right. Nobody survives life. Talk about that. So no one does survive life. We all end up leading. Turn it up, please. No. We all have a journey, and, and at some point it will end. So we don't, you know, we don't live here forever. There is an end in mind, and we have to keep it in mind and be intentional. And so I spend a lot of time now with people who are, their end is very near. Some of them, their end is in a few hours. Hmm. And so you start to really see what their life was about. You say that they, you know, I guess retained all these items and things like that, but at the end that doesn't mean anything to them at all. It means nothing to them. They... If they know Christ, there is a peace. The ones that I work with that do have a relationship with Jesus have a peace about them. But then I come into a lot of the rooms, and there's a lot of faiths that that are very different, and I come against all those. And I get overwhelmed, and I have to really ask Jesus to help me. And he said, you know, they're not crazy. They're they're just lost. So I need you to walk in and, and carry me with you as you do and show my light. And it does really make it a big difference because people say, how do you do what you do? It must be so depressing. And then I get an opportunity to tell them how. Jesus, he came into my life. He changed it unbelievably. And now I get to be here with you. What a privilege. But what a responsibility, too. Yeah, sure. 
to share him. And, and obviously, because you do, you do have all kinds of different uh, religions when you're in the hospitals and, and even patients are treated, you said, mm -hmm. uh, based on their religion. So you have a lot of, there's a lot of warfare that happens there, warfare. obviously. I mean, and, and, and that's one thing that you've learned so much about is warfare. And we were talking at the table yesterday and we said, you know, you realize what the warfare is for, right? When you go in a hospital and when you work like Chanel in the medicine field, when you work in hospitals, there is a spiritual warfare. What do you think that war is for? Souls. <laughs> Don't you think the enemy loves to show up in an atmosphere like that where that's the last second where Satan can grab as many souls as he can? And that's the truth. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. You know, it's the truth. Read your Bible. But, there. but there's constantly, you talked about being in those surroundings in, those, in that environment where, man, these religions can be overwhelming because, mm -hmm. and you talked about something about hijacking. Talk about that real quick. So they can be overwhelming and people don't. They don't even know sometimes the religion that they're following and their own beliefs. And so people get sicker and they can't, express their, you know, they become incapacitated, some of them, and the family that's around them chooses their faith for them and hijacks their faith. Mm. You know, a wife made her husband Jewish about a week before he passed away because he couldn't speak for himself anymore. And so I really encourage the Christians to speak your faith so everyone can hear it. So if you become incapacitated, we know you spoke so loud in everything you, you've done. There's no question. That's awesome. Of who you're following. And that's awesome because you, you've only been safe for a year. I, I'm telling you, it just, I mean, this girl, I, I mean. Be careful. Because, well, because, <laughs> listen, she's drinking the same, the same, out of the same water, out of the same well here when you come. You know, so what's the difference between her and a lot of people in church here? Well, the difference is that somebody's hungry and feeding, right? Someone's exercising listen to the last two weeks and so she's been growing so much that all she thinks about is where are these people going mm -hmm. she works in medicine she's expressing the love of God of course you know what her company or her the hospitals don't pay her to preach Jesus they don't pay her to read her Bible at work so please don't do that because then you just lose your witness you know but your lifestyle is what does all the talking right but one of the things that you, you we talked about yesterday too like God's really been developing even you recognizing a spiritual gift that he's blessed you with mm -hmm. and it's it's the discerning of spirits and talk about that because this is pretty wild what you've been seeing now because you're constantly around death constantly and i didn't know what the spiritual gifts were and things like that when i even when i was first saved but as you get closer and you step out he gives you more more and so now i see when people are leaving and i'm with them i see the souls leave and that's only been recently in it but i wonder where they're going because I don't know. I don't know where they're all going. So I have to be intentional now to speak more. It just gives me more um, motivation because I'm hoping that when I do see someone leave, I know exactly where they're going Yeah. more often than not. That's awesome. And the reality is this, is that you have a soul and your soul lives in a body. Mm -hmm. And that soul goes somewhere. It and it's interesting that God has allowed her to see souls actually leaving bodies. That's That's so... That's so deep, but I really believe that God has given you that grace because, um, because you really care about where people are going for eternity. I do. I really so, care. So now. thank you, thank you for that. Give her a big thank hand. You. That's amazing. Wow. All right, Rhoda. Rhoda is a wild lady. She's amazing. Rhoda, Rhoda is uh, someone who is. I mean, this woman does not walk in this church alone. She's always inviting people and when we were talking i asked her rhoda how many people have you invited to elevate church because she's only been here for less than two years and her faith has just like boom skyrocketed while you've been attending here so no one has an excuse for not growing in their faith but rhoda how many people have you brought to elevate church in less than two years i believe it's about 50 50 people 50 50 50 people, 50 50 people in less than two years yes. but here's the cool part it wasn't rhoda bringing all the other christians from other churches you know because how many of those people, out of those 50, how many of those have given their life to Christ right here at Elevate Church? I also believe 99% of them gave so their lives. So 99% of the 50 people, which means 49 out of 50 have said yes to Jesus right here at Elevate Church. Yes. Which is amazing. And this woman is uh, awesome. Just, just a Wednesday ago or two Wednesdays ago, she invited another person uh, who I thought was a youth or a college girl, like young girl, she got saved, got touched, and I did a whole goofy thing. I thought she was 
like super young, but come to find out, I connected her with another youth. I'm like, you guys are going to be best friends. Go get to know each other. She happened to be a grown woman. She's a dentist. And <laughs> I'm like, I'm so sorry for embarrassing you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sweetie, go back to your chair. <laughs> yeah. like, she's a grown woman. That's a dentist home practice. It's crazy. But you're amazing. Now, you work in the, in the business world. You are uh, someone who works in the corporate world. And you, it's, it's, you're surrounded with, obviously, people that are far away from God. But just your passion and how you share your faith. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Because I know that recently you were, like, at, um, not too long ago, you were at a Christmas party. And, and some crazy stuff happened. Yeah. Well, first, um, it took one brave friend to invite me that has radically changed my life. And because of God's uh, crucifixion kind of love I have received, I couldn't help but share the amazing love, peace, and joy, and hope that I have received. And I want all my friends, family, and whoever people I meet to have that That's awesome. uh, experience I am experiencing. So someone invited you to this table right. here. That's awesome. And, be and I believe that God has healed me not just for me. He's healed me to have a purpose and to lead people into Christ by inviting them uh, to church. And that's why I'm so uh, passionate and, and just inspired and encouraged to continue to invite um, friends. You're awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's going back to Pastor's question. Um, I have spoken to uh, our boss, kind of the head of the two dealership company and you know how it's like when I speak about car dealership um, a lot of broken people a lot of hurting um, so when we were uh, deciding about this big Christmas event um, I had asked her to pray before we have the dinner and she told me you know I'm sorry but it's not politically c correct or yeah um, to pray I was, I respected her authority, but at the same time, I was disappointed because she's a Christian. So anyway, a week later, um, I did my ninja move. <laughs> um, I was um, being creative, so I took my wrist to uh, pretend uh, that I accidentally sent the daily devotion to the owner and the other head of the company. And um, later, my boss um, called me and asked me who sent that daily devotion because he felt, the owner felt that, that, that God was speaking to him. And, he, and then she said, oh, it's Rhoda. And then tell her to- Just like to, a Christian, throw us under the bus, huh? <laughs> Just like Christians, like, oh, it's Rhoda, it yeah. wasn't me. So Christians do. So, um, yeah, so she said and told them, yeah, it was Rhoda. And um, a week later, I saw him, actually. And he said, you know what? Those are so amazing. Keep it coming. Wow. So I have been sending it. He's been reading it for, um, for a long time now. So I, I just praise God for giving me that boldness. I could have lost my job, but... Anyway. That's awesome. That's awesome. But so you, so so you were on this text thread of all management of the yes. company, and you accidentally... Accidentally. But I had asked God to forgive me for that. <laughs> <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire, but you did it anyways, right? But you know, when I think about stuff like that, you know what? The truth is this. Think about it. Like, the only reason that you even have a Bible is because there were disciples who were willing to die and to break the laws of not preaching this word just so you and I can have this in our hands today. Think about Jesus. The reason he was arrested and crucified was because he took what God said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Okay, they didn't like that. So um, when I hear stories like Rhoda, she's like, oh, I kind of lied. I'm like, you know, no, you didn't. I'm like, you were just being bold, and you did it. You went for it, and she took a risk, and she could have lost her job. But what I love about Rhoda is that you can see the fruit of her life. She just cares about people experience, experiencing the same love that she's experienced, the same transformation that she's experienced, that the owner of these dealerships is saying, Hey, man, I feel like God was speaking to me. Just, and this, it's been years now that this guy's been receiving all these devotionals from Rhoda, and all the management have to read it anyways, whether they like it or not. So give her a big hand. That's awesome, Rhoda. I love that. And I will never stop inviting. <laughs> hey, man, you keep it up, girl. This woman. You want to learn how to invite people? Talk to Rhoda. Okay. Um, that, well, let me ask you guys this question, okay? This is a good one. If, if sharing your faith was a crime, if it was criminal, would you be found guilty 
or innocent? Like, that's a good question to ask yourself. Like, man, am I innocent or am I guilty? You know, I want to be like the guy that says, I'm guilty as charged. Yeah, I share my faith. I'm not ashamed. And the reason why is because, you know what, there are people that, that need, like, this owner. And I'm believing that one day he'll come to his full salvation. It'll be the most amazing thing. And you'll probably have him sitting in here one day. Watch, you'll see. It'll be amazing. Now, Linda, Linda's awesome. Linda uh, has been with us here very recently. And... Uh, and she's been saved for 45 years, but then we thought, like, she's lying, man. Because you know what? How can you be saved 45 years and you look 25, right? Like, how is that possible? So we're like, come on, Linda, you're, you're, you're making this up. But for 45 years, you have been consistent, which is so rare to find in Christians today. It really is. It's, it's a rarity to find people that are consistent and faithful to God and loyal to God and, 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 and don't give up when times get rough. And like you've had to weather so many storms in life and you have been consistent. And, and, and not, just, not just for 45 years, but we're talking about, um, you know, living it. And, and yesterday I, I asked this question or this statement. I said, there are so many spiritually unresolved people in the world today because America claims that 80% of Americans are born-again Christians. No, they're not. No. A lot of people in America think they're Christians because they were born into religion, you know, or because my grandma prayed for me, I'm a Christian. So when you talk to people and you say, hey, uh, do you have Christ? You hear things like, ah, yeah, I do. Oh, I do. Oh, what church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to church. And and so you start finding out like, no, they they don't. They just have a bunch of information, but there hasn't been a transformation because there there's a lot of unresolved spirituality. And one of the things you said yesterday was, man, if you're gonna do this, you better live it. You have to live this. And for 45 years, you, your husband, your family have lived it in the church. And so talk about that. Okay. So, your microphone. So I've been in church all my life and um our family has and our we've raised our sons in church and um i'm very proud of them they serve god uh, i have a one-year granddaughter that even she knows jesus is you know jesus she holds the little baby jesus from the nativity scene I mean, she, she holds him like she knows she knows something you know and so um, it's, you know, you just have to talk it everywhere you go and you let people know. You go to Walmart or the grocery store um, and you let them know. Do you go to church? Where do you go? You talk to your neighbors. Would you like to come to church? Or you, It's just constant fighting. We go to this church or, you know, you just have to keep putting it out there. Um, stay consistent you know we read our word and it never gets old there's always something fresh um there's always something god answers prayers when you go through rough times he's there there's nowhere else you can turn but but to to jesus and i've seen prayers answered i have through my life i have seen him do miraculous things and i encourage you if you don't think it's real ask him ask him to show you and he will he will show you that he's real he will he will answer prayers for you it's uh, he loves us and he wants all of us i love that I, you know what i love about what you just said linda is that you know, so many times you, you're, you're, you're wanting to validate God for people. Or people are looking for people to validate. Like, okay, if God is so real, then prove it to me. Right. But I say if you have a challenge with knowing whether God is real or not, how about you challenge God, challenge the source instead of trying to challenging people to prove him to you. You know, yeah, right. I, I think we spend so much time wanting everybody else and I was that person, being that I was atheist, and, you know, so I, I always had this, but I was, I was yeah, I was mean. I, I didn't like any religion. Um, but when I came to Christ, he made himself real to me because I, I asked him, I want to know who you are. And he, listen, be careful what you ask for because he will show you who he is. And when he does, it's so real. That's, to me, Jesus is more real than the very chair that every single one of you are sitting on right now. He's more real than that chair. He's more real than that. So um, I, I love how, how you said that. If people are struggling with that, even when you're sharing your faith with people, like, hey, okay, you're struggling. Why don't you ask God? 
tell God to tell, let him show you that he, that he is the real deal, and, and he will. So thank you so much for that. All right, next we have, uh, let's see, is it Benny Gideon? Mr. Benny, let me tell you something. There's that book, Find Waldo. Where's Waldo? Well, let me tell you something. You always have to ask yourself, where's Benny? Because Benny is, no, listen, there's not a place in Santa Clarita. Like, I never tell people I'm the, I'm the pastor, the senior pastor of Elevate Church. When I go out and I meet with people, connect with people, I always invite them. I'm like, hey, you should come check out our church, and da, 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 and we talk. And I like, what church do you go to? I go, oh, it's Elevate Church. I'm like, oh, Elevate Church? Hey, man, there's this guy named Benny Gideon that goes, I'm like, oh, everywhere. I can be in the mall the restaurant, the coffee shops, man, getting my hair done. I could be at the trash dumpster dumping stuff off. Like everybody knows Benny in Santa Clarita. And, uh, and it's true because this guy is a connector. You know, he's such a gifted connector, but it's not accidental. He's very intentional on how he connects with people. But what's even more interesting, you know, Benny's a young guy, but he has this way where he can connect with, you know, all the ethnicities. And not everyone's good at that. Most people that are white connect with white people. Black people connect with black people. Hispanics connect with Hispanic people. Like, everybody connects with their own kind. But how many know that's not, that's not the gospel? No, we should be people that connect with all ethnicities, all ages, and that we're multi-generational, right? We're multicultural, and we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we don't have to feel comfortable with talking to a different race. I think when you're uncomfortable with connecting with a different race, you may have some stereotype issues in your life that you haven't addressed yet. I'm just saying, just throwing it out there. But Benny, oh my God, everybody... Every color, every creed, every age. I mean, from, you know, people that are old are like, oh, yeah, I know Benny Gideon. Everybody knows you. Everybody knows you. How do you do that? How do you connect? Well, then, okay, um, for me, I just fear God. Uh, I live my life every moment in his presence. I, I aim to acknowledge God and acknowledge people. And I always remember, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So I apply that everywhere that I go. It doesn't matter. All the places he listed, I do it because I, I value people. Something God has really drilled into me that I didn't mention at the 8 or the 10 is he's drilled into me to value one. Because one is so important to Jesus. He leaves 99 to go after one. Yeah. And so if you can't value one, you can't value 99. There you go. And that's, that's something he's drilled into me. And I just want to share a quick story with you guys about this. But... um. And, and I want to encourage you, too. A lot of you guys may feel like you're not qualified to share the gospel or your experience. But I want to tell you the Holy Spirit's the best evangelist. If you have him inside, it's not about you. It's just about flowing with him. And, and half the time, you don't even know you're being used, like the story I'm about to tell you. So I was hungry. I went to in and out because it's an amazing, blessed place. Um, <laughs> if you guys have not been and you're from out of town, go find one right away after service. I promise you won't be disappointed. So I'm at church in and, and in and out, right? Yeah, church and in and out. You know, it's the weekly thing. So make sure to go. But I'm in and out at in and out, and this guy is outside because the line gets really long. I've never seen a short line at in and out. So they send people out to speed up the orders, and he's taking my order, and uh, just intentional with him and doing unto him as I would want someone to do unto me. And I, I just thanked him. I just said, "Thank you so much for working so hard. Thank you for being out here. How's your day going?" He just goes, you know what, man? My day sucks. I'm like, great answer. Um, <laughs> option B. <laughs> but so then I just, I told him, I just want you to know that Jesus really loves you. And then I asked him, could I pray for you? And I asked for, asked him to reach out his hand. And I, I just grabbed his hand and then we started praying. <laughs> and uh, just started praying for him. And after we were finished praying, he goes, you know, that's the craziest thing. I was just asking God about an hour ago for a sign. I'm like, wow, like, I didn't even know, like, this wasn't planned, like, man, glory to God. So, God goes to in and out, man, I'll tell you. God will afford any opportunity yeah. to love someone through your life. Yeah, he will. And so he did. And so I got the guy's number, and I'm on the way out now, and there's this rule. It's like when you get to the last window, if your hand reaches more than twice, you're in trouble. <laughs> People will be really mad. So there's this girl, she's handing me my stuff, and um, you got 25 seconds. I always think, People, Jesus, clock. I'm like, how do I put them all together? And so I knew I had like 25 seconds to talk to this girl. And 
just in 25 seconds, I just told her, you know what? On your hard days, I just want you to remember this, that you are so deeply loved by Jesus. And this girl just looked at me and like tears welled up in her eyes. And she's like, I had a horrible day. I really needed to hear that. I'm like, praise God. So a couple days go by, I connect with the original guy that I got his number. And he's like, you know, God, I prayed for a sign. And we go out and uh, we're talking to him. We have an hour conversation. And in this conversation, this guy starts taking notes. I'm like, what are you doing? He's starting to take all these notes about Jesus because I'm just telling him what God's putting on my heart. And afterward, we're about to leave, and um, I asked him this question. I was like, have you ever invited the Lord into your heart? Because he was telling me he was baptized, and he's plugged in, serving at church. And he, he thought about it, and he's like, no, I, I've never intentionally invited the Lord. I'm thinking, how the heck did you get baptized, dude? Like, how are you? <laughs> what? This doesn't make sense. Let's fix this right now. So I prayed out loud, and I asked God for tangible evidence that him and Jesus had met. And so after we prayed, he invited the Lord in. His face changed. He went from being very depressed to starting to laugh and to smile. And all he could say is, I feel lighter. I feel lighter. My backpack's heavy, but I feel lighter. That's awesome. Isn't that great? I love that. I love that. I love that. And then Frank, yesterday, he made a very, very great, um, it was a great, statement question but he said this if the fate of christianity rested on your shoulders would it be on its way to extinction and i just thought that was so brilliant but just share about that what did you what did you mean by that yeah so so let me explain um one of the things that i struggle with when outreaching to people just sharing the gospel is so that sometimes i care too much about what they think of me you know i i never want to be that you know that weird christian you know those be like I don't want to talk to you. It's like, no, I'm different. Wait, listen to me. Um, you know, they'll, they'll Give me a chance. It. Yeah, they'll smell it a mile away. Um, but, you know, it's th that's my excuse. That's my hang up. And we all have excuses, right? You know, yours could be, um, I don't have enough time. I'm too busy. Um, I have kids or I have a job. It could be, I don't know enough about the Bible to, to share the gospel. It could be, um, I'm too afraid. I hate rejection. Whatever it is, um, they're all excuses. And the truth is, there is no excuse on why you shouldn't be sharing your gospel or sharing the gospel. Um, so what you have to do is, is you know, take a moment right now in your seat and pretend that you are the only Christian in the world. You're the only one. There's no Bibles. There's no pastors. There's no churches. There's nothing. You're the only Christian. And then you ask yourself, if the fate of Christianity rested on your shoulders right now, is it headed on its way to extinction? You know what I mean? It's a tough, tough question. And it brings us to um, Matthew uh, 28, where Jesus told his disciples, he, he came back and he said, um, all authority in the universe has been given to me. Now, wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And to summarize what Jesus is saying is, I have all power now and go and share the gospel. There's no reason why you can't do it. I, I love, I love the, the Great Commission in general, but what I love about it is that it's the personal Great Commission. It's, it's not a group thing. It's not, you know, Team Jesus, hey, you know, Benny, thank you for, for you know, sharing the, the, the gospel for all of us. We could take a break. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's Jesus invited us as a group, but, but we have the responsibility individually yeah. to um, share good. the gospel. That's good. And if you don't, if, you, if you've never, never, never looked at it that way, it's important that you do. What I do is I, I like to assume that everybody that I see is going to hell until I verify otherwise. Um, and, you know, it, it just so happened a while ago. I, I like to do these challenges too, like Benny, where, um, you know, I'll see, you know, how many people I can share the gospel with, how awkward I can have a conversation with, you know, who I can um, just lead to Jesus. And, you know, I decided, hey, I'm going to just, I'm going to tell people that Jesus loves them. And so I went right next door to the, the, the mini Martin liquor store. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to tell whoever's there, the worker, that, um, that Jesus loves them. And it just so happened there was a, a girl that was working. And I, and I said, hey, can I ask you a random question? And I asked her, has anyone ever told you that Jesus Christ loves you? And she looked at me and she said, you know, no, nobody's ever told me that. Um, and it was a huge slap to the face because I'm thinking, how can, can we, Elevate Church, be right next door? I mean, she's not a new work. She's been there years. Um, and nobody's told her that Jesus Christ loves her. 
You know, and it happens when you don't make it personal, when you don't make the commission personal, when you don't say, you know, Jesus is asking me, you know, not Pastor Mauricio, not all of us, but he's asking me, and I have to do that, you know, and it, it just turned out that I'm glad she, she does know Christ, um, but wouldn't it be sad if I was too afraid to ask her that question, and I would never know, and she went to hell. Yeah, and that's a good point, because you have to ask yourself the question, I wonder if my neighbors, I mean, how long had you been living next door to someone, and they don't even know you're a Christian? You know, or or like he said, he he just assumes that. And I know you don't have to be all religious about people going to hell. I know that sometimes as Christians, you can become so religious and you just you scare people into heaven. You know, um, I don't think God did that with any of us, and we shouldn't have to do that to anyone either. But you have to look at people like driving. Let's say you lived in this cul-de-sac and you're driving home late at night, and this house is burning in some serious fire flames and what's the first thing you're going to do well i think if you have a heart you're going to get off your car and run and and knock on that door and make sure that you tell the neighbors like hey your house is on fire get out get out call 911 you'd probably wake up a bunch of people scream yell you'd do whatever it would take to save those people but i think that when you look at people all around us your neighbor is the pe people that you come across with every day and their house is burning, you know? And when I mean their house, I mean their house, their life. And, and so many of us just kind of walk nonchalant, like, you know, oh, well, right? We just kind of check out. Uh, but thank you for that. That's awesome. George, let me tell you, George. George is like another Benny. Everybody knows George. George, George, George. Um, as a matter of fact, let me tell you a story. When we did the March, March Madness series, um, I went to a park, and we were supposed to meet our film crew there, and I got there before they did, so I just kind of was waiting at the basketball courts, and there was this African-American guy there, and, uh, and I'm just right in the courts, and, uh, and just, you know, just trying to be nice, smiling, like, hey, man, but, you know, you can tell that he's just kind of like, he just had like this funky face, kind of like, you know, whatever, and I'm like, okay, so, you know, he's, he was doing this sh shots and everything, and he turned around and be like, <laughs> and still whatever, just kind of like, you know, just like, who's this wacko? you know, Hispanic dude here in our neighborhood, whatever. Um, and, uh, and so you get, so then the film crew shows up, right? And, uh, and they brought the basketball. So I start playing basketball like that. And the crew's getting ready. Cause we're going to, we're about to do a film. And, uh, the guy's like, Hey man, what you doing? And, and, and I'm like, oh, I'm like, Oh, we're about to do a film for, for our church. Didn't tell him I was a pastor. Uh, and he's like, Oh, for your church. Like what church do you go to? I go, Oh, I go to elevate church. He's like, nah, I go, yeah. He's like, I've been to that church. He's like, there's this little guy. I already knew what he meant by little guy. <laughs> okay, in Santa Clarita, George is known as the little guy. Everywhere I go, it's the little guy. And I said this. I, when he said little guy, I'm like, I'm like, George. He's like, yeah, George. George invited me to your church. And, and I went to the He's like, wait a minute. You're the pastor. And I'm like, yeah. You know, surprise. Whatever. <laughs> But, uh, but it's amazing how, how you look at stories like that because George is also well-known everywhere. This guy has brought so many. He, listen, he invited people at the 10 o'clock service. They all received Jesus at the 10 o'clock. This is, this is the kind of guy he is. But, you know, one thing that you would not know about George, George is the most coolest guy. He's one of our youth leaders here at church. This guy is a magnet like nobody's business. You know why? Because he's raw and he's real. But he wasn't always like that. And I didn't know this about him. But George used to be one of those really you know hardcore religious judgmental critical type of people and yesterday he said you know what if i were to tell the people anything he said i would say this he said don't be so spiritually minded that you're earthly no good right. and so talk about that man because you I, I would have never thought that about you because you're different yes so yeah there was a time in my walk with the lord where i was just very religious um and very critical of everyone and anyone even other christians <laughs> Um, it got to the point where people didn't like having me around because I was always pointing the finger and judging. Um, and even my, my own mother didn't want me at her house because, I mean, she's a wow. Christian herself. And she didn't <laughs> want me there because I would always walk in and begin to criticize. Why do you have a Christmas tree? Why do you have angels? And why do you have – anyways, that's a long story. But, you know, instead of inviting people to the table, I was pushing people away. Mm. And God really had to convict me. You know, he, he's called us to reach people, but yet I was, wasn't reaching anyone. If anything, I was pushing people away. So he began to convict me, and he said, you know what? You're wrong. 
I repented and I said, okay, Lord, forgive me. And I began to ask him, Lord, teach me to see people the way you see people. And he started, you know, allowing me to see people the way he saw people. But not only that, I asked, God, give me the love that you have for them. I want you to fill me with your love. So, you know, my family was used to the religious George. And because they knew the religious George, they, I didn't tend to get invited to the birthday parties and so <laughs> forth. Because, again, what would I be doing? I'd be judging and criticizing people. So, little by little, I started getting more and more invitations. And I would go and... The religious George would just go for a short time because, again, I didn't want to be there too long because they were sinners and pagans and so <laughs> forth, and heathens and fire and brimstone come down from heaven, and I'm just playing. Um, but what ended up happening is I ended up staying for longer periods of time, more invitations, and by the time I knew it, me, uh, we, me and my wife were the last ones there. Something also switched up. Before we would go into the parties, we'd begin to pray and say, God, Right now, as we're about to go to this family event, we want you to fill us with your love. And if there's an opportunity to be used, then use us. So, again, we ended up being the last ones that would leave these parties. And pretty soon, a conversation would start up about who? God. And that was God opening up the doors. And those conversations, in the end, were left with an invitation for my family members to receive God into their lives. And it happened. Um, you know... Your family members may not understand the Christianese that we sometimes speak, but one thing they do understand is love. So that should be our prayer. God, fill us with your love for these people. I don't care what, where they're at in their walk, what they're doing, what kind of sin they're in, but show me to love them the way that you love them. Yeah. So yeah. That's awesome, George. Give them a big hand. Give them all a big hand. They did great today. You know, as, as we leave now, I want to leave you with this last verse because we're one week away from Easter, right? You have Good Friday, uh, two services. You guys can put the schedule up. And then you have Sunday, four services. Good Friday, you have a, put the service times up, please. Thank you. Uh, you have a 7 p.m. and an 8.30 p.m. on Friday. Good Friday. Easter Sunday, you have an 8 a.m., 9.40. Someone going to come up? 9.45 a.m., 11.30 a.m., 1.15 p.m. And so there's so many options, guys. But listen to this. Remember, if you were here on week one, I read Luke 14. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, just this latter part of what Jesus said. He said this. He says, and the servant, after returning, said this to Jesus, sir, what you commanded has been done. And still there is room. Remember, say there is room. And let me tell you something. We will never be the church that says there's no room for you in any area of our ministry. There's room for everybody. I don't care where you come from. You know what? We've made room for people that have come in here that are blown out homosexuals, you know, lesbians that come in here. And we make room for everybody. I don't care what your past is like. I don't condone the lifestyle, but let me tell you something. But we will love you back to life. And we've had people here that literally have changed the course of their life, how they live, all because the love of God they've experienced here has been so real and raw. And that's, that's what we, we, we want people to know. That there's room for everyone here, regardless of where you come from. And he said this. He said, um, there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house, so that my house may be filled with what? With guests. Well, guess what? You and I have a job to do in the next week. If these messages, if this series at the table hasn't rocked your world, let me tell you something. Nothing will. Nothing. If, not, if, next, if this week we come and we're not bringing people... It shows the state of your Christianity. Nothing will move your heart anymore. Nothing. Nothing. Because it can't go any deeper than talking about, you know, Lazarus and the rich man and, 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 and how there's heaven and hell and, and it doesn't move you. Something's wrong. And so it says, so compel people to come so that my house may be filled with guests. For I tell you that not one of those who were invited and declined will taste my dinner. And we've had people ask these two simple questions like, but what if I don't have enough, you know, Bible knowledge? What if I don't have the confidence? Here's what I tell people. Get over yourself. Seriously. You're, we can become so self-consumed about what we think, what we know. Get over yourself. You know what? You do have a story. Your life was changed. You were lost, but now you're found. Just tell people how much God loves them. You heard what Benny said. Other questions that people have asked. But what if they reject me? 
They're going to. I've been called a spick, a wetback, a lowlife as I've shared my faith with people. And of course, you know what? Thank God I'm saved now because if it was the old man they were telling that to, oh, help me, Jesus. Sometimes you want to put the salvations out. Let me go put a whoop on you and then resurrect you back to life or something like that, right? Or you just want to tell people, like, you know, go to hell then, right? You, you, that's what you're thinking, but you don't say it. But the reality is this. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. So what if people reject you? Good. I hope people reject you. You know why? It don't make you stronger as a believer because you'll, you'll stop making it about you. When you just like hearing yes, 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 then you're a yes man. No, just let them say no to you, man. Like, no, I don't want to hear that. Okay, man, God loves you. Bye. That's it. Move on. So don't make an excuse. In this story, Luke 14, the story was about everybody making excuses of not wanting to come to the invitation that God was giving them. But let me tell you something. Let's flip the strip. A lot of Christians make excuses of, of why they don't reach people with the love of God. So let's reach people. You have one week. Easter is the highest attended service of the entire year, even more than Christmas. Stand to your feet. That's a great opportunity for us. And if you're here today and you're saying, I'm not a church person. Like, church isn't for me. You know, that stuff is strange. You know, I didn't think I was all into church. But maybe today you heard something that was like, you know what, okay. He, he makes a point. These guys make a point. Let me tell you something. At this church, we're never going to force religion. We're never going to force relationship. We're never going to force anything. We're not going to force God on you. Do you realize that God has given you this wonderful gift called free will? It means you get to choose where you're going to spend eternity. Every single one of you. You get to choose if you want to spend eternity in heaven with God forever. Or you get to choose if you want to spend eternity in hell. Those are the two options you get. And God says, hey, listen, life and death is placed before you. God gives it to you. He gives the answer. He says, why don't you just choose life? Like you got, like here's the deal with people that, and take it from an ex-atheist. What do you have to lose if what I'm telling you is the truth? Nothing. But you got everything to gain. If I'm telling you the truth, because you're right here right now, like you are going to live forever. But here's the truth. You're not promised tomorrow. Neither was I. When I was on my deathbed with cancer, let me tell you something. I was not promised. I was a Christian, loved God, serving God. And I'm in the hospital with cancer. And doctors said, there's nothing else we can do. I was at the verge of life and death right there. But there's something beautiful when you have peace. And when you know, God, I don't want to die yet because I got kids and a wife. But if I die, I have peace with it, God, because I know where I'm going. There's something beautiful that when you know that when you leave this earth, you know where you're going. But I know there's people in this church right now, in this service, all day today, people have said yes. Okay, why? Because here's the reality. You can be here right now and be gone by later today or tomorrow. I pray all of you live a long life, but here's the truth. We've had people come to this church who have given their life on a day like this and by the evening passed away. Don't mess with your soul. You know why people don't come to Christ? Oh, because it ain't cool. I, I'm going to lose out. You ain't, listen, you're already losing. You gain with Christ. Yeah, but Christianity sucks. Okay, then why don't you do something about it? I make Christianity look fun. Right? I do. I, I have fun with Christianity. Like, if you think Christianity is boring, you've been hanging with all the wrong Christians. Come hang out with us and you'll see how fun we make it. We have a blast being a Christian. You know what I'm saying? We got a motorcycle club. You know what I'm saying? Driving Ducatis and Harleys. I mean, we're crazy like that. And people are like, what are, we, what are you doing? You guys, you guys are crazy like that? Oh, we're crazy like that. We love, why? We love people. So I'm here to give every single one of you an invitation to receive the greatest love. It's your choice. Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 20, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. Why does he knock? Because he'll never barge in. You must open the door. It's your choice. You choose to invite him in. But here's what happens. When you invite Christ in your life, you are guaranteed a eternal life with God the Father. When you reject God, let me tell you something. You choose what you choose like the rich man did. He chose what he chose until it was too late. God loves you. Every eye, every eye closed, every head bowed, please, in respect of those that may want to respond to God today. If you're here and you're saying, Pastor, that's me, I want to receive Christ. I don't, want to, I don't want to know him religiously. I've seen too many goofy religious people. I've seen Christians that have given God a bad name. Well, let me tell you something. Then, then why don't you flip the script? Why don't you make God look good? Why don't you go ahead and say, you know what? My walk with Christ will be different from the one I've already seen. If you're here and you're saying, 
I want to receive this salvation. I want to receive this love, this Jesus. I want to know him for real. When I count to three, your hand will go up in the air. Listen, countless people have come today to Christ. Countless. It's been amazing. You're not, you're, you're not, you're not being left out of this. God's inviting you right now to receive his salvation, to receive this wonderful gift called eternal life. At the count of three, I want you to lift your hand up high in the air, and then you can put it right back down. No, I won't trip, but raise it high so I can see it down, and then we'll all pray together. There's no shame in this. You shouldn't even be afraid about this. Ready? One, God loves you. Two, stop being afraid. You know you're here with purpose. It's not by accident you being here. Ready? Three, if that's you, lift your hand high in the air. Quickly, quickly. I see those hands. Okay, good, good. I see those hands. Awesome. Awesome. A lot of you went up, down. No, no big deal. If you didn't lift your hand because you were too afraid of what people would think, who gives a rip what people think? Stop caring about what others think. If your heart is beep, just beating like, do it, do it. Don't, don't, don't neglect that moment. God wants to save you. At the count of three, if you did not lift your hand and you want to lift your hand now, here you go. Ready? One, two, three. If that's you, lift it high in the air and put it back down. I see those hands. Awesome. Perfect. Let's all pray this together. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, every one of them. Today, I receive new life in Christ Jesus. I'm born again. Fill with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awesome. For those if today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.